Let's pray now for our time of reading and studying the Word. Our Father God, we just ask that today as we come before you, and as we come and bow ourselves before what you have said to us through the Scriptures, we ask God that there would be deep contemplation on our part, a genuine self-examination on our part, that we would truly consider whether or not we are in alignment with your will. Help us, God, today to hear your word. I pray that you would give us ears to hear by your spirit. And today I ask, Lord, that there would be true transformation that comes from knowing and trusting in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Please open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 58. Uh, Last week, Mike preached a very convicting sermon from Isaiah chapter 57 regarding idolatry. And in particular, you'll remember that Isaiah was focusing on those people of Judah who were considering themselves acceptable to God, even though they would consistently go and worship other gods. And God was speaking out against those people who openly rejected the idea of one true God. God describes them as mockers and scoffers in regards to how they treat Him. He calls out their unabashed worship of idols, and He even focuses in on their sexual sin that would accompany that false worship. And chapter 57 closes with the resounding of this ominous promise, There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. So the focus last week was this group of people called the wicked. But now we are turning the page to Isaiah chapter 58, and God's going to focus his attention on not those openly idolatrous people. He's now going to call out those people who still held the traditions of worship, but as we're going to soon see, their outward acts of traditional worship were still not pleasing to the Lord. It was just another form of idolatry. Listen as I read to you the words of Isaiah 58. Cry aloud. Do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily, and they delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted, and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves, and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. In such, is such the fast that I choose, a day for a person to be humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, I am here. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and the speaking wickedness, If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt and you shall raise up the foundations of many generations." You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your own pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, 
if you honor it, not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, our examination of this passage is going to be framed by looking at this passage through two distinct lenses. First, we're going to consider Judah's failures. Then we're going to see Jesus' successes. And then we're going to consider two applications for ourselves. Let's begin by seeing how Judah has failed. Listen in to some of the ways that God describes the religious observers in Judah in this chapter. Verse 2, God says of them that they, quote, "...seek me daily." And delight to know my ways. It also says that they, quote, delight to draw near to God. Now, if that is the only information that we had about them, you would probably think of these people that they are pretty good. In fact, you might even think that these are like the upper echelon of all of the Old Testament saints. But let's be honest, there's not a lot of competition in the Old Testament. But there is a very important little term that I want to make sure that we catch right off the bat so that we understand where God is coming from. Look at the beginning of verse 2 again. It says, Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgments of their God. They're acting as if they haven't completely betrayed me. Have you ever had this happen to you where you are having a conversation with somebody and you are being genuine, you are being honest, you are being sincere, and you say something that is true and meaningful to you? Uh, Maybe you're saying something about how much you care for somebody, or maybe you're talking to them and explaining how hard you have worked on a project, and then you hear these two words from them, as if, as if. Have you ever heard that before? Maybe that's just a younger generation thing where it's, maybe it's from becoming a youth minister that I heard that so often. But seriously, this term is very, very negative. In fact, what does it even mean? It, it implies worse than just doubt. It doesn't mean that they're just giving you a side eye. It actually indicates that they sp- suspect that you're doing more than exaggerating or overstating it. That little phrase, as if, indicates the outright rejection of everything that you've just said. It's a pithy way of just saying, you're a liar. You're a faker. The things that you are presenting right now are completely and utterly untrue. Notice that little phrase that is nested snugly into the middle of verse 2. And God says to Judah, look, you do all these things thinking that you are pleasing me with your worship, but you do them as if you haven't rejected everything else that I have ever said. There are two main forms of religious practice that God is going to call out in this chapter fasting and Sabbath observance. And what we're going to do now is we're just going to take some time to consider each one of them in turn. In the Old Testament, God does command the Israelites to fast. But I'm curious, does anyone know how many days a year the Israelites were supposed to fast? Does anybody know? Can anybody give me a guess? Give me a guess louder. I heard the correct answer. The correct answer is one. Out of the whole year, one day. And in fact, that's not even entirely true because it was a sundown to sundown fast on the Day of Atonement. So literally on Friday, you eat an early dinner, you pack your stomach as full as you can, and then you go to bed. And then the next day, you skip breakfast, you skip lunch, and then as soon as the sun goes, then eat again. Literally, God requires a fast of two meals a year. And around that that idea of fasting, there grew up this incredible apparatus of man-made and man-imposed religion. By the time we get to the New Testament, the Pharisees have made a practice of fasting twice a week. Do you remember that parable that Jesus tells of the Pharisee and the tax collector who go up together to the temple to pray? They don't go together, but they meet one another there. They're standing next to one another at the wall praying. And while they are there, one of them can't even look up. He, he's just so distraught. And then the Pharisee looks at him and says, Thank God I'm not like him. I fast twice a week. The first thing he throws out there. Look, look how good I am. I take this religion so seriously that I starve myself two days a week so that I can honor God. God never requested that of them. Then, according to God, listen to how he describes their fasting in Isaiah 58, verse 3. He says, 
they respond and ask God, Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and you oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under himself? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Look, these people, they were, let's face it, these guys are committed. They are method actors. They would put on an Oscar-worthy show that was displaying their so-called piety by bowing themselves down and putting on sackcloth. And sackcloth, by the way, is just this most uncomfortable and most cheap product that you could possibly make into clothing. And so it was only worn by people who were desperate and absolutely poor. And so they're, they're putting on this incredibly uncomfortable clothing so that they would look like they're impoverished. And then they would go to their ovens and they would take out ashes from the expensive food that they had cooked the night before. And then they would pour it on their heads and on their arms to make their skin and their heads look filthy and dirty. And they would do this as a way of acting like they are pious. God summarizes this kind of acting in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, Matthew 6, 16, when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Now, by the time we get to Jesus, it's more than just ashes that they would put on. In fact, by the time we get to Jesus, we know from history that they actually had makeup that the Pharisees would apply to their faces and they would find ways to make under their eyes look darker and they would put on makeup to make their faces look skinnier like they were starving to death so that it actually looked worse than it even was. I have this kind of rule, don't trust any man that wears makeup. But these fasts were not worshipful towards God. They were a way to worship an idol, the root of all idols, the idol of self. And God defines their motivation by saying, Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure. You're doing this, not for me, God says. You're doing this because you like it. You like the responses you get. You like when people look at you and they think highly of you because of the things that you're doing. You are not doing this for me. You are doing this for you. Let me give you a hypothetical uh, example that may or may not have its roots in reality. Uh, Just imagine that there comes a day when Ashley and I are speaking to our kids and we say, hey kiddos, listen, uh, the two little ones are down for a nap and mommy and daddy, we need to go outside and sit on the porch swing. We have to have a conversation about a few things for a while and when we come back in, we want your rooms to be completely clean and we want this downstairs to be completely clean. So when we come back in, what do we need? And the kids respond, it's going to be clean. Okay, good job. We're going to go out and we're going to have a conversation. Now, About half an hour, maybe 45 minutes later, we come back inside, and the first thing that the kids say is, guess what, mommy, daddy? We made you dinner. And then we see the inedible meal concocted of everything in our house that contains sugar. And on top of that, now the kitchen is also an absolute mess. And the kiddos ask the question, don't you like it? Meanwhile, they've never cleaned up a single toy. Now, that story is apocryphal. It's kind of a mixture of various true events bundled together. But it is a kind of picture of what the Israelites are saying to God. In verse 3, they ask, Why have we fasted and you have not seen it? They're basically asking God, Don't you like it? Don't you like what we're doing? We're doing this for you. And his answer is very clear in the following verses. He basically tells them, You are doing all of the things that I didn't command you to do. And you are not doing any of the things I did command you to do. Look, being a Christian is difficult, but it's not that complicated. The rules that they had, look, they are difficult to follow. But they're not that complicated. They're obvious, yet they refused to do them. What was the mess that they didn't clean up? Look again at God's explanation in verses 6 and 7. Is this not the fast that I choose? to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked to cover him and 
not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Now, what's really interesting here is that last line, those last couple of words, actually you need to read those back into everything he just said because that makes this entire scenario even worse than we originally thought. He says these people are from your own flesh. What does that mean? That quite literally means they're your family. These are your own family members. And look, your brother or your sister, they're outside, they're poor, they're homeless, and you refuse to bring your brother or your own sister into your house? Your mom or your dad, they are impoverished, they are, they're isolated, they're alone, they're poor, they have no food, and you choose not to feed them? What's wrong with you, God is saying? You think that I'm going to be happy here by all of these fasts that you produce, even though you're not doing the simplest thing imaginable, loving those that I gave you in your own family? This is not even like going to Manhattan and picking up a stranger in Penn Station who's lying there on the ground and saying, hey, do you want to come to my house? This is your own family member. But they come to church and they make a public spectacle about how holy they are and they talk constantly and incessantly about how hungry they must be because they constantly find themselves fasting. Now, you may have noticed that there's a category of people called oppressed in this chapter that pops up repeatedly. And it appears from verse 6 that these people were slaves or indentured servants. Now think of it like this. Think of a plantation owner in Mississippi or Jamaica or Brazil before the institution of slavery was systematically eliminated. And imagine that that plantation owner was a believer in Jesus Christ who would go to church on Sunday and then go to purchase slaves at an auction on Monday. Hypocrisy. But fasting was not the only practice that the Lord sets his attention upon. Jump down to verse 13, and you're going to see that there's also a problematic heart regarding the Sabbath. He says, if you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly, Then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now here we find that yes, they were observing the Sabbath, but they were doing it in ways that were seeking their own pleasure. They were, as God says, going their own way. They had taken the Sabbath and they had mutated it into something that was absolutely unrecognizable to God's original purpose. They began to create their own man-made laws and to make the Sabbath fit their own ideals. In verse 13, God calls on them to turn away from doing their own pleasure. Now, I could go on an extended rant of the historical deviations that were made from what the Sabbath was to what it became in their man-made regulations. They invented all sorts and varieties of things. I could go on an extended foray into that, but I don't think I need to. Because I think you still see some of those from the Jewish community today. Sabbath elevators, Sabbath settings on refrigerators, staying home on the Sabbath but watching sports on television. For every superfluous rule that has been made, a dozen ways have been found to still do whatever they want and to avoid worshiping God, which was the point of the Sabbath in the first place. To be clear, we in the New Testament era... We do not have the requirement to keep a Sabbath. But in those days, the Sabbath command was very real, and it was very central to their practice of worship. In fact, read the Ten Commandments, and the only kind of worshipful activity that you will find in a corporate manner that is presented in the Ten Commandments is the keeping of the Sabbath. Now, this chapter reminds me a great deal of Psalm 50. In that chapter, we read, Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me, but I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds. In other words, God says, look, I'm not mad at you because of your failure to sacrifice. Look, you constantly sacrifice. I I see it every day. It is constantly before me, but I don't like it. In fact, it makes me sick, and I'm not going to accept it. God is not angry at them for their negligence to sacrifice. He is angry about their failure to observe the meaning of the sacrifice. In our chapter today, God is not angry with them because of their negligence of the Sabbath, but because of their abuse of the Sabbath. And it has become worthless. As, as always, God is more concerned with the heart than he is with the outward appearance. These people, they're just wearing a costume of righteousness. 
but they have hearts of darkness. God is displeased with them because he is displeased with their self-worship. But consider how gracious the Lord is to these Israelites. If it was you or me in God's position at this point, it would literally be like, let's just squish them. Thankfully, God is gracious, and he makes a promise to them of what life will be like if they simply turn and repent and worship him truly. Let me walk through God's seven promised blessings with a running commentary, starting in verse 8. It reads, Then shall your light break forth like the dawn. Now remember, the past several chapters have been set in the context of Judah's failure to be a light to the nations. That was their job. You're supposed to be a shining city on a hill. You are supposed to be presenting the reality of God's grace and God's love to all of the nations. But their sin and their disobedience caused their light to be extinguished. But Isaiah explains that if the people will just repent and just worship the Lord in truth, then what's going to happen? Then you will shine forth like the dawn. The promise is repeated later on in verses 9 and 10 where he says, If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in the darkness and your gloom be as noonday. Often, it is true that the first thing unbelievers notice about Christians is either their love or their lack of love. Missionaries from across the ages can affirm that when they go into a new place and people are skeptical of Christ, one of the ways that God employs to soften the hearts of those who do not believe is by the uprightness and the kindness of the missionaries towards them. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn. The second promise is that your healing shall spring up speedily. Have you ever had a cut? like on a thumb or a finger on your dominant hand where everything you do seems to aggravate it and it just seems like it's never going to heal. It just keeps taking forever. And every time you think it starts to heal over, it breaks open again. Well, that's kind of what Judah was like. They're, they're constantly starting to heal. God will begin to do a good work and then they do the exact same sinful things and then it breaks open again. And it feels like it's never going to be complete. Judah was a sick nation. It had a deep-rooted cancer of idolatry and a heart disease called hypocrisy. And those sins produced an incredible number of other sicknesses in their society. But God promises, I will heal you. I will heal your land if you just repent. And God promises, if you turn and worship me truly, healing shall spring up speedily. The third promise is that your righteousness shall go before you. Now this could mean two things. It could mean that their reputation of righteousness will precede them. So again, this is kind of like what we spoke of earlier, that other nations would look at them and they would acknowledge these are a people of righteousness and they would see that and consider God's goodness. Or more likely, and this is the direction I lean in the interpretation, is that this is being used in a military way to speak about how God's righteousness will guard them. It will go out like a warrior before them to protect them. Think of it like God saying, look, if you repent, I will be the protection of your nation. When these enemies rise up to attack you, I will conquer them. This is very common of their people in those days. If you remember back in the Old Testament when they were entering into the land, who was it that said, I will go out before you and defeat your enemies? It was God the Father. And the Israelites, when they left Egypt and entered into the promised land, they were only able to do so because it was God who did go before them. The fourth promise is that the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Continuing with this kind of military language, we just saw that God promised to protect their front. He also is promising in a similar way that God's glory would be a deterrent from any enemy that might sneak up on them. Look, you don't see them. You're unaware of them, but I know who they are. I know from where they come, and I will defend you with my glory. Promise number five, he says, then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. Now earlier we saw that the people of Judah were frustrated because God would not respond to their uh, illegitimate fasts. And they're saying, look, we're, we're fasting constantly, God, and in our fasts we're asking things of you and you're not responding to them. Now God is promising that if they just repent, 
he will listen to them, and he will respond to their prayers. Isn't it a great thing that God answers prayers? The sixth promise is that the Lord will guide you and continually satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. This year we planted a garden at our house. Uh, to be more accurate, Ashley planted a garden at our house with uh, the kids' help. And so far, it's actually going really great. Uh, we have plants growing all over the place and producing all sorts of vegetation. Uh, but the reason that those plants are surviving on hot days like we've been experiencing is because Ashley has gone out and she has faithfully watered them. And God here is speaking to the people and saying, look, you have a desire, you have a thirst, but if you thirst for me... I will water you. If you just stop thirsting for your own attention, for your own reputation, for your own power, I'm not going to feed that desire. But if your desire is for me, I will satisfy your desire in scorched places. He speaks about them like we don't know about scorched places. We live on the seacoast of the United States. Everything around here is pretty much green. But if you go into the desert... Just hang out there for a couple of minutes. He says, in a place like that, I am going to make you satisfied. I am going to make you strong. Here he speaks and promises continually to satisfy the longing of the heart that is thirsty for him. Now, if you weren't here this past Wednesday to hear David Cook preach about hungering and thirsting for righteousness, you missed a great sermon and you missed something that would uh, greatly bless you. I encourage you to go back and jump on the website Find that sermon and listen to it. It will encourage your soul and convict you. Uh, But there is a promise that we see for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, that God will satisfy them. The seventh promise that we see here is that your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt, and you shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to dwell in. Look, Israel had a lot of ruins. We don't really see a lot of ruins because any time a building becomes dilapidated, it pretty quickly gets purchased and demolished and replaced. But they had cities all over their land that were just spots of old rocks piled on top of one another where a city used to exist, but now it's just a pile of ruins. They had their cities destroyed by the Egyptians and by the Edomites and by the Assyrians and the Syrians and the Babylonians, and in fact... Many times, Israel and Judah fought each other and destroyed each other's cities. And so they would constantly fight and end up with these desolate places. And God uses those places, those cities, literally and figuratively, to explain that the people are going to turn and repent. And if you do, you're going to go back and rebuild those things that were lost. They would remake and repair all the damage that had been done by previous generations. Now, here's the big question. Did the Israelites ever hear this? Did they ever repent? Did these people from Judah ever listen to God's command and turn? And did they ever receive these blessings? Well, the answer is complicated. Because it does seem as though there was a brief revival that occurred during their time in exile. And it does seem as though on a small level, God did answer these promises and give them to the people. For example, we read in Ezra and Nehemiah about how the Israelites returned out of exile and they came back and they did rebuild. And during that time, there was a partial revival. But if you pay close attention, already by the end of the book of Nehemiah, already the people had begun to once again turn to idols and begin to marry their children off to Canaanite women, which were bringing in more and more of the pagan practices. Their repentance was brief. And their blessings were brief. Which leads us to our second point today, Jesus' success. Look, we've seen a lot of failures from Judah. These people, they got a lot of this stuff wrong. But this point that we're considering now, Jesus succeeded. Now, this point is far shorter, but far more important than the first. The point of every chapter in the Bible is Jesus. He is the focus of every one of them. And he is the focus of our text today. How? Very simply this. Jesus is the one who succeeded in every way that the Israelites failed. His love for the Father was never artificial. He never was hypocritical. He never put on a mask. He lifted up the oppressed. He cared for the downcast. He, as John would describe him, was full of grace and truth. Now consider 
that Jesus has brought all seven of these blessings to his people. First, he causes us to shine forth like the dawn. Now that is why Jesus can say that I am the light of the world in John 8. Who is it that shines forth? Well, it's Jesus that shines forth like the dawn. Where he be lifted up, he will draw all men unto himself. But that's also why he can say in Matthew chapter 5, 14, that we, his disciples, are the light of the world. Now, he had told Judah, I want you to shine like the dawn to all nations. Well, today he is telling that to the church. I am the light of the world, therefore you can now shine my light to all nations. He causes us to shine forth like the dawn. Secondly, he brings us full healing. We were sick, not with physical ailments, although many of us experience those as well. The Bible refers to our sin as a sickness. And consider what 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. That is the gospel. He brings full healing. Thirdly, he gives us his own righteousness for protection. Look, the one thing that you need more than anything else in this lifetime is righteousness. If you go to the end and you stand before the throne of God without righteousness, you will perish. 1 Corinthians 5.21, he, speaking of God the Father, made him, speaking of God the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That is the gospel. He gives us the hope of his glory. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glorious of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is the gospel. He answers our prayers. John 15, 15. You did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you so that you might go out and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. That is the gospel. Also, he promises to satisfy us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 7 through 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do, now, do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy. What is joy but satisfaction of the soul? Joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That is the gospel. And he promises that he will rebuild that which was broken, and he will bring us into the work of his building. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 and 11. According to the grace of God given me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. So here's the good news. These blessings are ours, but they are ours only in Christ Jesus Just like the Israelites, we have failed. But thanks be to God that Jesus has come for sinners, sinners of every kind, even hypocrites. Now, if you have never repented of your sin and trusted in Christ for your salvation, I plead with you. I plead with you that you would turn and believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. For those who do know him, I want to consider just two quick applications of this passage. Let's first consider hypocrisy. Now, it can be really easy to look back at these people. It can be easy to look at these religious Israelites and call out their hypocrisy. Earlier, for example, I also picked on the low-hanging fruit of illustration with a slave owner. But let's stop looking out there. Let's stop looking across the street or across the aisle or at your spouse or your children, and let's look into our own hearts. Ask the question... Am I a hypocrite? Well, what is a hypocrite? The word hypocrite in the New Testament Greek is the word for actor. Somebody who puts on a mask and plays a part. They're putting on a role while they're in front of people, and then as soon as they walk off the stage, they resume their own lifestyle. 
Does that describe you? It described the Pharisees that we read about earlier in Matthew 23. They cleaned the outside of the cup and the bowl, but the inside was still filthy. They looked like a whitewashed tomb, but inside they're full of dead man's bones. Does that describe you? Is that the way that we are living today? Are you singing the songs on Sunday and then living like the world the rest of the week? A, an, a hypocrite is a faker. A hypocrite is a fraud. Oh, let me clear something up for you. That does describe you. And that does describe me to some extent. Because every single one of us have claimed that there is a worthiness in Christ that is worthy of our entire life. And then we still turn and we fall short of the glory of God. We claim that it is worthwhile to do His will. And then we go out and we do our own. All of us fall short in that way. But I want you to understand that it is not hypocritical for sinners to call out sin. You do not have to be perfect in order to worship the Lord faithfully. If that was the case, nobody would have any business being here. I, I certainly would not have any business being in this pulpit preaching to you right now. I mean, consider this. What person, what preacher, what Christian could ever say to someone else, God says to you, be holy as he is holy. How can I say that? Because I am certainly not a holy person. And I have certainly fallen short. Well, the fact of the matter is that you and I are sinners. And we've been redeemed. We still inhabit these sinful bodies and we continue to have sinful desires. It's not hypocrisy to fall. That's something else. That's sin. And it still requires repentance. Hypocrisy comes in when we pretend that we're not sinful. Hypocrisy is the pretending that we are righteous. Hypocrisy is the pretending that we are doing things rightly when we know that we are doing them wrongly. Hypocrisy is the rejection of the truth that you need Christ to cleanse you. And that's what makes it so vile and dangerous. But there is no mask that you could ever put on that will fool God. You might fool everyone else, maybe even everyone in this room. But God sees your heart. And today, if you are hiding in your sin, if you are living in darkness, just be real with God. Be real with each other. Let the mask come off. Confess your sin and repent because God hates hypocrisy. But His arms of love are open to every hypocrite that repents. The second point of application today is that of true worship. Our religious activity is not intended to gain God's favor. Listen, you, you have never gained God's favor by being so powerfully righteous that you got His attention. I mean, God is not looking down at the world and saying, oh my goodness, I have never seen somebody do something that righteous before in my life. He is not looking at you in that way. In fact, every single day, you fall short of His righteousness. If it relied on you to obey Him enough to gain His attention, you failed the first day of your life. Our worship is not designed to gain His favor. We have that through Jesus Christ. Our worship is to enjoy God and to honor Him. In this passage, God called out the people of Judah for worshiping in ways that were simply designed to give themselves pleasure. They were willing to perform all these various rituals. Why? Ultimately, he says, it's to make yourself feel good. I remember a time very clearly when I was speaking with a friend of mine in high school who was Roman Catholic, and I was explaining to her that confessing to a priest isn't biblical. And I remember very clearly her response when she said, who cares if it's biblical? It makes me feel good. Now, again, we can poke across the aisle, but how many evangelicals treat the church the same way? How many people in this room have treated this church in that way? We intentionally pacify ourselves with worship that pleases our senses. How many people who attend this church will make attendance dependent upon, do I feel like it today? How many of us will judge service by how much we liked the music today? Or how many times we laughed in the sermon? Our passage that we read this morning was written to people living under the Old Covenant. But consider the words that Jesus said as this time of the Old Covenant promises were passing away to the New Covenant commands. He was bringing about this new and better covenant. Jesus says, John 4, 23, But the hour is coming, 
and is now here when true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. So when you come to church, why are you here? I mean, really consider that. That's, that's the question that God is asking the people of Judah. Why are you doing this? You need to examine your hearts. Why are you doing this? Are you here to bless him? Are you here to celebrate Christ? Or are you most interested in how service will make you feel? Church, the service should make you feel good. It should give you joy. Unless there is an area of sin in your life that is in opposition to God. I remember uh, several years ago I was at a different church and I was not the pastor of the church at the time, but there was a visitor who came and he began attending regularly for several weeks and I, I began to spark up conversations with him. And after a few weeks he said, I don't think I'm going to be coming back again. And I asked him, why? Is there something that happened? Is, is there something wrong? And his response was, you know, I just want to go to a church that makes me feel good. There are some times that I come here and the pastor is preaching and I just feel miserable. And I said, what exactly makes you feel miserable? And I didn't know this man very well. I didn't know his life story. I didn't know his circumstances. And he began to explain to me his, his marital situation, how he had left his wife. And how when the pastor would preach about things with marriage, that it made him feel bad. Well, why does he feel bad? He feels bad because he's in sin. Preaching of the word is designed to afflict the comfortable. It is designed to make us feel the need of repentance and to turn to him. So I ask again, why are we here? What are we doing? We are called to come here to love Christ and to hear him, to listen to his words and to be conformed into his image. So church, may we be a church that does worship him in spirit and in truth. May we not be like these original readers. May we never gather only to feed our emotions. May we come here to love Christ and to love one another. For Jesus is worthy of every ounce of our worship. And we are worthy of no worship at all. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are merciful to hypocrites. We thank you that you have redeemed sinners of all types. Lord, in this room, we have some people who more match the description of the people in Isaiah 57, who were open idolaters, open about their sin, who lived adulterous lifestyles, who lived in forms of sexual sin that was out, outrageous to you. Perhaps many in this room more represent that before they heard Christ's news of the gospel and believed. But Lord, there are many in this room who grew up in a church and who acted for many years and who pretended that they knew you before indeed you opened their eyes and saved them. Lord, I pray that if there is anyone in this room right now who is an unbeliever but who simply desires for people to think highly of them, and they are wearing a mask. God, I pray that you would convict their hearts and that you would save them. Lord, I thank you that you saved Pharisees. I thank you that you saved Nicodemus, who came to you by night. I thank you, God, that you do redeem and you save even the most vile of hypocrites. God, I thank you that you have saved me. And God, I pray that today, as we come to the conclusion of this word and the conclusion of our service, that you would not let the this time conclude our contemplation and self-examination of places where we might be hypocritical, where we might be harboring sin, where we might be continuing on in worldliness in ways that you have called us to eliminate. Lord, I pray that we indeed would be people that take seriously your word and that we would put it into practice. We know that we can't do this without your work and your help. We pray that you would do that for us now. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.